Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Asif Almasok. Today we are going to discuss uh, about carcinoma colon. As you know, that the, the colon has uh, different parts: the ascending, the cecum, the transverse colon, and then the descending and the sigmoid colon. So uh, we will try to take things uh, separately. So today I'm going to start with the malignancies involving the right-sided colon, that is the cecum, the ascending colon, and parts of the transverse colon. Now, firstly, I'd like to remember uh, one of the best actors of the new generation, Chadwick Boseman, who's the hero of uh, uh, Black Panther, who has uh, recently died at the age of 43 from colon cancer, just at the age of 43. So it was diagnosed about a few years back at the age of 40. And after that, it became so advanced. The patient and the, the, he, even the American surgeons could not uh, decide what to do with it. And ultimately he died of it. And uh, people say that he also did many movies when he was suffering from this advanced malignancy. He is a hero of uh, Black Panther, if you remember. I have, I have, I'm greatly fond of this movie. I've watched it many, many times. Okay, so what are the particulars of the patient? Um, first, the age. Now, in the many of the books, if you look at the books, even in Bailey and Love, you'll see the age and the commonest age of malignancy is above 50 years. But uh, just if you remember Mr. Chadwick Boseman, who has been diagnosed with this cancer at the age of 40, and he died at the age of 43. So you can understand that Although commonly this malignancy occurs at the age of 50, but uh, it can definitely happen at an earlier age. And in Bangladesh, it is very disturbing that uh, many, many patients, nowadays we are getting at the age of 30, 35. Uh, last week we have done, I think, two cancer patients uh, below the age of 40. So this probably has to do something with our, um, the pollution, the formalin in, in our foods and the other things that, uh, that we are doing wrong. Um, all, as all malignancies, uh, the solid malignancies, all solid malignancies are more common in male patients than female. Although uh, in Bangladesh, we get both male and female patients equally, and there is no real statistics for that. Occupation may be important. Uh, sometimes some occupation has to do with uh, radiations and uh, people who are associated with radiations or, or who ever inhaled a lot of smokes um, can be suffering from different type of malignancies. So it's always a good idea to take a little history about the occupation of the patient. Chief complaints, it's very important. Now, before I start with the chief complaints, uh, let me just, show you this thing. Remember this, symptoms can be subtle. It's very important that you remember the right-sided malignancies are always subtle and non-specific, and even absent until late at A, late in the stage. Because in rectal cancer or the left-sided malignancy, the bleeding is visible, but the right-sided malignancy, even if there's some bleeding, which usually is mixed, with stool and even altered. And uh, during defecation, uh, there's no evidence of bleeding. So the patient has no idea that something strange is going on in his body. What happens, the commonest complaint, the patient comes to us with, with generalized weakness. Now, why this weakness? What happens is most of the malignancies are ulcer proliferative. Uh, that means there's an ulcer and uh, in the ulcer, there is always some bleeding. Now, as you understand, the bleeding is not visible. The right-sided bleeding are usually mixed with stool. They're altered and they're at the end, they're not visible to the patient. So there is uh, uh, some unexplained bleeding going on in the body and patient has no, no idea about it. And uh, after a few months, when enough bleeding has taken place, the patient becomes anemic, but the patient will won't be able to give you any idea where, how, how he is losing that blood. This is called unexplained anemia. Now, one of the surgical causes of unexplained anemia is 
carcinoma sicum. And patient has no idea what anemia means. The patient usually presents to the, pa to the doctor with generalized weakness. When this malignancy becomes a little bigger and starts to obstruct the lumen, usually what happens, the right-sided colon is quite wide. If you see the cecum, the cecum is quite wide. And here the terminal ileum. And this liquid stool comes here. And because the cecum is quite wide, so the malignancy takes a long time to cause obstruction. On the other hand, the left-sided colon is narrower. So usually they produces obstructive features earlier. And you'll see there's a chance of altered bowel habit in the form of constipation and obstruction. But in the, on the right side, usually there is less chance of obstruction. So usually the patient comes to the doctor at a later stage and with an advanced stage. And then you get a mass in the lower abdomen. So usually generalized weakness, abdominal pain, and sometimes mass in the lower abdomen. These are the chief complaints of the patient. Sometimes there is actually no complaint. Sometimes the patient only comes to you with weakness. And the patient goes to a gastroenterologist or a medicine doctor who does a colonoscopy and from the colonoscopy, the diagnosis is being made. But usually there are no specific complaints. So this is one way of writing the history of presenting illness. According to the statement of the patient, he was reasonably well over six months back. Now, uh, there's definitely um, sometimes uh, some of the examiners don't like this Term. You can also start with, according to the statement of the patient, his presenting complaint started say, about six months back. You can write like that. His presenting complaints, his complaints started six months back. Both is okay. You can write it like this. According to the statement of the patient, he's reasonably, he was reasonably well about six months back. Or if you like, you can start with, according to the statement of the patient, his complaints started about six months back. He noticed that he has been increasingly, increasingly feeling weak and tired when during his daily activities. So the patient went to a doctor. The patient usually goes to a doctor that uh, what is happening, why I am feeling tired all the time. And the doctor probably did some investigation. One of them probably was CBC, that's complete blood count. And he was hospitalized and given two units of blood. So this statement gives you an idea that why the patient was feeling weak. It's a very good little sentence to describe what's happening. The patient was feeling weak, patient went to the doctor and the doctor diagnosed that patient has anemia and gave two units of blood. He probably got more than that over a period of time, but at that time he got two units of blood. So from this very statement, you can understand that patient was anemic or patient was losing blood one way or the other. Then for the last four months, he is having pain in the, pain in the right lower abdomen, which is colicky in nature. Now, if it is colicky, that means there is probably some sort of obstruction that is taking place. Remember one thing, obstruction is rare in right-sided colonic malignancy. Why? Because right-sided colonic malignancies, the right-sided colon is wide. Okay, the right-sided colons are wide and the stool is liquid stool. So the chances of obstruction is less, but obstruction do happen. And if that happens, that means it is an advanced malignancy. So you must be able to uh, nicely describe the pain, which is colic in nature, moderate in intensity, non-radiating, lasting for hour an hour, no specific aggravating or relieving factor. So the colic Pain always gives you an idea there is some sort of obstruction that's going on 
in a luminal structure. Okay, about one month back, he noticed a lump in the right lower abdomen, which is gradually increasing in size and associated with constant aching pain. Now remember, whenever you see a lump in the abdomen, just a lump gives you an idea that this is a very advanced malignancy. It's a very advanced cancer. Palpable lump during examination is always an advanced malignancy. Remember that. Now, he has no fever. Why did I take a history of fever here? Because if you remember, always the right sided, any lump in the right side, is a, there's a chance that there may be an intestinal tuberculosis. That's why I took the history of fever. Then I took another history of vomiting, constipation, and abdominal distension, which is obviously you can understand that I am trying to take a history of obstruction, which is again a sign of advanced disease because any mal malignancy, any intestinal malignancy can cause obstruction. But has lost about five kgs of weight, five kgs of weight in two months in spite of good appetite. As I've told you, it, the patient may or may not have a good appetite. These are non-specific features. It is normal, occasionally passes dark colored stool. Again, this is non-specific. Dark colored stool can mean anything. But remember, don't say patient is having melina because if you remember melina, melina only takes place due to bleeding of the upper abdomen. That is bleeding from the in, uh, stomach and duodenum. Do not say the patient is having melina, it's wrong. Okay. Past medical history, that's past disease history. Uh, as you have heard, the patient has taken four units of blood previously, four units of blood transfusion. Okay, remember any colorectal malignancy because there is always a chance of metachronus, metachronus. Metachronous tumor, that is tumors which usually happens six months after removal of the primary tumor. Six months or even after that. These are called metachronous tumor. And there are synchronous tumor, which is which happens simultaneously. Inflammatory bowel disease. If you remember ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, both have tendency towards cancer, right? Rare, but they can happen. History of polyps. If the patient has multiple polyps, adenomatous polyps, adenomatous, adenomatous polyps, it always has the chance that there may be, they may turn into a malignancy. Personal history, again, very important. The history of smoking and alcohol. Alcohol is rare in Bangladesh, but smoking is common, which has, which has, which has, uh, which is a predisposing factor for all malignancy. Poor diet, low fiber, high fat. Now these are nowadays in many research, they say that the low fiber diet has predisposition towards malignancy. High BMI, low physical activity, they also has uh, protective patient, patient who has low BMI or normal BMI and who does physical activity, it is a protective effect against cancers. And so, so I always urge my patients that go for physical activity, at least one hour a day, do some exercise. Family history, family history of any hereditary disease, but more importantly, colorectal malignancies family history of colorectal malignancies, because you know, all malignancies, are, almost all malignancies are genetic in nature and family history is very important, especially first degree relatives, first degree relatives, and even if their history is, they, if they have malignancies in an earlier age, that is great, lesser than 45 years, there's a high chance that it has a genetic predisposition. Inflammatory bowel disease, again, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease have rare, but can turn into malignancy. Agent PCC or APC, that is hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer and adenomatous polyposis coli, they have very high, almost 90 to 100% chance 
of becoming cancer. Socioeconomic status, you must take this. Why, let me tell you, not only to diagnose the disease, but you should be the try type of treatment you are about to provide to the patient. You have to take the history. For example, just let me give you an example. If you, we, we use staplers, right? Nowadays we are commonly using staplers, right? Okay. Now the staplers are expensive, right? So in case if a poor patient comes to you, it is better to go for hand sewn anastomosis. Hand sewn anastomosis, okay? Hansion anastomosis. So the socioeconomic status is not very important for diagnosis in this case, but if you want to treat this patient, make sure that if it's a poor patient, go for Hansion anastomosis, which would be cheaper. Immunization history, take it if you think that there is a chance of tuberculosis. Menstrual history, definitely if it's a female patient, you must take the history. Okay, on general examination, you usually will find that the patients are ill-looking if it's an advanced cancer or there may not be any feature. The patient may be absolutely normal. Bodybuilders usually average, cooperative decubitus, nutritional status, again, remember until and unless a colorectal cancer is advanced, there is no features on the nutritional status. I have seen even patients with 90 kg body weight who has colorectal cancers and they have not lost any weight. They have no loss of appetite. There's no history of weight loss, the, but the patient has cancer. Remember, if the patient has upper GI malignancy, then there is a chance of weight loss and cachexia, but lower GI malignancy, usually they do not have any feature until and unless they are very advanced. Past blood pressure, anemia, definitely. The patient will have unexplained anemia. But make sure that the, take the history of blood transfusion because the patient may have blood transfusion. So uh, during examination, you might not find any anemia. But if you don't find it, always ask if there is a, if he has, she has taken any transfusions. Okay. John, this may be present if there is hepa, very rarely, very rare. Very rare. Okay. Local examination, abdominal examination. Always remember that the, on inspection, you must be able to have a good description of the abdomen, the shape, the contours of the abdomen, the anterior abdominal wall. As you can see in this patient, if you look at this patient, the anterior abdominal wall is not scaphoid, but distended abdomen, because there is a swelling over here, right? You can see the swelling. If you want to describe this, so anterior abdominal wall, there is, it is distended abdomen. The umbilicus is slightly deviated to the right side and looks everted, right? And there is a lump. Where is the lump? If you divide this into nine quadrants, so the lump is involving the right iliac fossa, the lumbar, the hypochondriac, the epigastric, the umbilical, and also the hypogastric area. So six of the quadrants are involved. You measure it. You measure it. It may be, let's say, 20 into 30 centimeters. Shape is as if it looks oval, but malignancies are irregular in shape. Remember, malignancies are irregular in shape. Then you palpate, you see the consistency and you'll see it is hard in consistency, hard in consistency. And then it's fixity. Remember to take the remember to examine for fixity of all swellings, all swellings. You must examine for mobility. It is very, very important. If it is fixed, 
well, then it is, uh, firstly, if there is a lump, it's an advanced malignancy. If there is a lump, remember, if there is a lump, it is advanced. If the lump is fixed, it is inoperable. Always remember this. If the lump is, if you can palpate or if you can see a lump, it is usually an advanced disease. And if it is fixed, if you can't, it is immobile, then it is an in, inoperable malignancy. Remember that inoperable, clinically, this is an inoperable case. Okay, make sure you do the head raising or the leg raising test always to check because the examiner will see whether you are doing this or not, because this will allow you to differentiate between an intra-abdominal, for example, if this is the rectus muscle, if this is the rectus muscle, a tumor may be superficial to it, a tumor may be within the muscle, tumor may be under the muscle. Now, in a leg raising or a head raising test, this tumor, the tumor which is superficial, will be more prominent. And this one will be impalpable. You won't be able to palpate it or it becomes less prominent. And the lump that is within the muscle will become fixed, will become fixed, but it will be equally palpable whether it is, whether the muscle is taut or not, but it will be fixed to the muscle on head raising or leg raising tests. Okay, so mobility is another factor, very important. Uh, you also must be able to examine for ascites. Liver must be palpable, blood must be palpated for hepatic metastasis, which is not uncommon in colorectal malignancies. So you must palpate the liver. Shifting dullness also should be done. And digital rectal examination, always do this. So salient features, if you remember, salient features should contain the important negative and positive findings. So this is one way of writing it. Mr. X, 50 years, a farmer from Borishal was admitted with the complaints of lethargy. I think the spelling is wrong uh, for six months. Uh, lethargy or weakness or malaise, whatever you wanna say, you can say that. Colicky lower abdominal pain for four months. Colicky lower abdominal pain for four months and lump in the right iliac fossa for one month. That's it. He is severely anemic and he has an intra-abdominal mass in the right iliac fossa measuring about 10 into 8 centimeter, irregular shift, hard, mobile, and fixed. Now, this is my way of writing the salient features. You can certainly improve on it. There's many ways of writing it, but make sure it contains the important positive and negative findings. And so that you can make a good diagnosis or some differential diagnosis from what you are saying. This is very important. Now, if you look, the patient is lethargic. That means the patient has probably has anemia, lower abdominal pain and a mass or lump in the right iliac fossa. He's anemic. And an examination, we can also confirm the patient has a mass in the right iliac fossa. So this gives you an idea that it's probably a malignancy or something to do in the right colon. So the provisional diagnosis or the working diagnosis or the clinical diagnosis is carcinoma of cecum. It can certainly be other findings like Crohn's disease. Now remember, Crohn's disease is not very common in Bangladesh. I think ileocecal TB would be a more appropriate first differential. Appendicular lump can certainly be there. Crohn's disease should come to number three, I think. Lymphoma is again another rare, but something that happens. Retroperitoneal tumor, must be able to examine a retroperitoneal tumor 
make sure you do a knee elbow test. Knee elbow test to differentiate between an intraabdominal lump and a retroperitoneal tumor. Investigation. The first and the most important investigation which is used to confirm the diagnosis and exclude the DD is colonoscopy and biopsy. Now remember, this is a right-sided malignancy, right? This is a right-sided malignancy. So what we need is very difficult to get a biopsy from here without cutting the patient open. There's another way of doing this with a CT scan, but which is very hazardous. So what we do is we use a colonoscope, which goes all the way here, and then takes the biopsy. It has a visual impression of the tumor, and it can take the biopsy as well. So it's very, very good investigation. I mean, colonoscopy is the gold standard investigation for any colorectal disease. Always remember that you must do a colonoscopy to assess any, any colorectal disease. Always go for a colonoscopy. Why? Number one, in this case, first thing we can have a visual impression and we can take a biopsy. We can also diagnose a synchronous lesion, right? We can also see if there's any polyps on the way. The patient may have multiple polyps. So we can do that. And the best part is these polyps can be removed by a colonoscopy. So this is the great thing about colonoscopy. And I, I urge all the colorectal surgeons who wants to, who wants to become a colorectal surgeon to learn how to do a colonoscopy because that decreases your dependency on other investigations and you can do your diagnosis yourself. Uh, we certainly want to stage the disease. Commonly, we go for an ultrasound, a chest X-ray and a liver function test. Uh, barium mill study we do not do nowadays. You don't have to talk about it. This is only uh, theoretical importance. But most important for me is a contrast enhanced CT scan of whole abdomen and chest. This is the best investigation for staging. Although you can say definitely it is not available, there is a chance of uh, radiation hazards and expensive, but these are the best investigations for staging purposes. But theoretically, definitely you must talk about ultrasound, chest X-ray and liver function tests. Serologic marker, the carcinoembryonic antigen must be taken because we must assess the baseline. The baseline, then after therapy. To check whether any improvement is taking place or not. It's very, very important. Remember this, carcinoembryonic antigen, number one, we check for to assess the baseline um, baseline, it also gives an idea because if it is very high, that means an advanced malignancy. Now, always remember, uh, carcinoembryonic antigen, it's not a specific uh, antigen. Uh, it's not specific marker for carcinoma colon. For other things, it can happen, but we always do that. Number one, because to check whether it's advanced or not, to assess the baseline amount, to assess, then we can compare it with after therapy, after surgery, and then recurrence. Recurrence. So this is also very important. Uh, always check for carcinoembryonic antigen. And then lastly, fitness for anesthesia and surgery. This is all in uh, short. Now, just want to show you something. 
Remember the contrast enhanced CT scan of the abdomen pelvis. Just remember these numbers. You don't have to memorize anything. The sensitivity is about 50 to 80%. Check out from the any biostatistics books what, uh, what it means, the sensitivity and specificity. Very simple thing. Just check it out. Okay. Uh, so colonoscopy and biopsy. You know, during colonoscopy, we can assess, we can visually see the tumor. We can take biopsy from it. Uh, sometimes even in the colonoscopy gives uh, colonoscopic features of a, can differentiate between a malignancy Crohn's disease and TB they're slightly different in their appearance so by just by seeing you can have a visual impression of what the problem is now you, if you remember the types of malignancy the types of macroscopic features of uh, colonic malignancy. If you look at this, sorry, this is an ulceroproliferative growth. What does it mean? If this is the colonic mucosa, the tumor is something like this. Hmm. This is an ulcerative proliferative growth. What happens from this growth, the bleeding takes place. These are commonly the ones that bleeds. This is an ulcerative proliferative growth. And this is the ulcer. So from here, bleeding takes place. Now, if you look at this, the right-sided one, this is an annular growth. What happens is if the colon is like this, the annular growths are usually this narrows the lumen. If you look at this, the lumen has been narrowed here. And the annular ones are the ones that obstruct the lumen. It's the annular growth. And this one is a tubular growth. Tubular growths are sort of like this. It also narrows it, but annular growths are one which are most strict, forms the greatest amount of strictures and it obstructs. But tubular growths are something like this. And usually there is a lumen enough for the food and other materials to pass. But the annular growths are the ones which forms a stricture, the ring, narrow ring, around the colon. And this is a poly, polypoid or cauliflower lug growth. If you look at this, this is the stalk and this is the poly. So this is a polypoid like growth. If this is the colonic mucosa, it usually something like this. So sometimes uh, they ask that which of these four are the most aggressive. The most aggressive is the ulceroproliferative one. Remember this because this, space, this spreads deep into the wall and ultimately to the surrounding structures. So these are actually worst and they usually present as T3 or even T4. Which one is the best? The best one is the polypoid one because their growth mostly is into the lumen. So they can present sometimes as T1 or T2, usually not further than that. Also, the annular growths can also, for an advanced growth, they causes obstruction. And as a result, that is also a feature, it's a bad prognostic factor. It's a poor prognostic factor for the patient. Now, if we do a CT scan, what do we see? Look at this. There is a C and this is the cecum and you can see an ulcerative proliferative growth over here. CT scan is another very good investigation 
for instance, but sometimes you are not able to pick up small tumors. So that's another problem. Hepatic metastasis. You can see multiple hepatic metastasis. Very good investigation to pick up the hepatic metastasis. Now, this is another investigation. This is called virtual colonoscopy. Virtual colonoscopy. This is virtual colonoscopy. This is a, another thing is called CT colonography. CT colonography is another term that's being used. Uh, this is a very good investigation, especially if there is an obstructive feature. For example, if this is the colon, and let's say here is an obstructive tumor over here. Now the problem is you cannot do a colonoscopy, right? Because the colonoscope won't pass to the proximal colon. So what can we do? Because we want to check for whether there is a, another synchronous tumor or there are some polyps over here or not, or any other problem with the colon. So in that case, we do this virtual colonoscopy or CT colonography. So what happens is that you give this patient, uh, you give a bowel preparation to this patient and uh, then uh, you uh, insert some air into the colon of this patient to distend the colon and then do a CT scan. As you can see, the colon is distended and then do a CT scan. And it has got the ability to pick up very, very small, very, very small polyps as well. Certainly tumors can also be picked up, but even polyps can be picked up. So CT colonography or virtual colonoscopy is another investigation. Nowadays, uh, many of the examiners are very interested in this investigation. Um, so you must be able to talk about it. I think Bailey and Love has a lo lot of information or enough information for this. What happens, again, let me tell you, give a bowel preparation. For this, a bowel preparation is necessary. Then we instill some air into the colon to distend the colon and then we do the CT scan. Uh, in the YouTube, there are a lot of videos you can check out from the YouTube how this is done. Barium enema, again, it has uh, really now uh, not a uh, great importance, but definitely theoretically you must be able to understand because if you see, this is the colon, right? And if the patient has an annular growth, then this part gives an impression that this is a apple core, that is the, somebody that has eaten the core of the apple, co, uh, the sides of the uh, apple and only the core remains. So this is called the apple core appearance. The apple core appearance. Now, another investigation, this is very, very important. Now, remember many different times what happens is uh, you do not, uh, um, in a right-sided mass uh, that I have seen, even in CT scan, they say that there is a right-sided mass and in colonoscopy, you don't find anything. That's when a good investigation is staging laparoscopy. Or even if you have found a malignancy, during staging laparoscopy, you can check for peritoneal seedling. Remember, peritoneal Seedling. Peritoneal seedling. This is the only investigation that gives you an idea whether the patient has peritoneal seedling or not. So this is very important. CT scan or any no other investigation can pick up peritoneal seedling. Another investigation that is sometimes being done, not commonly done in Bangladesh, is PET scan. Uh, I will discuss about this uh, later, but PET scan again, it acts uh, as uh, you, uh, you check, you do this before you do uh, chemotherapy. And then to check the response of chemotherapy, you check, do another PT, CT scan after chemotherapy. Now remember CT, PET scan is a very, very in, um, expensive investigation. Um, so it is it has to be done with great judgment. Make sure that you don't uh, commonly in advise the patient to do, the, do this investigation. So after all this, when your biopsy is confirmed, 
you say the patient has carcinoma cecum. The patient may have carcinoma in the ascending colon. So if this is the colon, this is the transverse colon, So this is the carcinoma of cecum. The patient may have any, any malignancy anywhere in the ascending colon or even in the hepatic flexure or in the proximal transverse colon. Now remember all of these are under right colon cancer. So maybe in the cecum, maybe in the ascending colon, maybe in the hepatic flexure or maybe in the proximal transverse colon. These are all right colonic malignancy. Right colonic malignancies. So what is the treatment? Always remember treatment will ultimately depend on stage. Treatment will depend ultimately on stage. Today, I am not discussing about stage because I want to talk a little bit about the uh, surgeries of colonic cancer because the staging is always the same. We always try to follow the TNM staging, right? TNM is tumor in situ, T0, that is mucosa and submucosa. Sorry. T0 means no tumor. TIS means tumor in situ. T1 means mucosa and submucosa. T2 means the muscle layer. just reaching the muscle layer, but not beyond the muscle layer. T3 means beyond muscle layer. And T4 means adjacent organs. For example, if this is the mucosa, this is the muscle layer, And this is the serosa, let's say. So T1 means tumor up to here. T2 means tumor up to the muscle layer. T3 means it's beyond the muscle layer to the subserosal layer. And T4 means it is beyond the red, beyond the colonic tissue beyond the end, beyond the mesocolon into the surrounding structures. It has reached to the surrounding structures. Remember the colon has, has also has a fatty layer around it and this is called mesocolon. Just like rectum has mesorectum. It's very important for you to understand the surgeries of colon. Okay. So number one, we depend that, you, that it depends on the staging. It always needs a multidisciplinary team. Multidisciplinary team means what? A multidisciplinary team means you need definitely one, need the surgeon. You need a surgeon, you need an oncologist. You need a radiologist. You need a pathologist. If you think the stoma may be needed, a stoma care nurse is needed. A gastroenterologist may be necessary. Also, if you think the patient may have a psychological problem after having a stoma, a psychiatrist is also necessary. So always remember that any tumor, any treatment of any 
uh, uh, malignancy is dependent on the decision of a multidisciplinary team. And yes, one thing I have forgotten, the anesthesiologist. The anesthetist must also be present because sometimes there is the patient may have different comorbidities. Patient may have a cardiac problem, patient may have respiratory problems. So anesthesiologist must be present as well. So surgeon, anesthesiologist, oncologist, radiologist, pathologist. If there's a stoma, the stomach care nurse, gastroenterologist, psychiatrist, if necessary, must be present in a multidisciplinary team approach to decide what type of treatment is necessary, whether the patient should have a surgery first, whether the patient should have a new adjuvant chemoradiotherapy first, or palliative treatment is necessary. So pre-operative preparation, definitely you are gonna take consent counseling and if a stomach marking should be done, what, is the, what are the important points that you should be talking about in the counseling? Definitely, uh, uh, if you have a patient uh, uh, with a colonic malignancy, let's say in sickle malignancy, then you tell the patient, Assalamu Alaikum, I am Ami Hachi Dr. Asif Almasok, or Ami Dr. XYZ, Apnar patient at Chicket Shami Kurbu, Apna Chicket Shami Kurbu, Apna Shamushata Huece, Shetaho Chege, Apna Kadunalite, Colon Buleki Jagate, Shake Colone Rokane at the cancer huye. Then you also talk about that what, what is a cancer, a little bit about idea about cancer, but tumor huece, a tumor to the Japan Shuri Rekidi, a little Shuri Jabe, Ebung Bachar Kuno Chans Takbena. To Jebabe of Tumor Takamade, get a bear Koreniash Tabe. So, operation if you can do it in a laparoscopic setting, you talk about laparoscopic setting. If you can do it in a uh, open setting, then you talk about open, how you are going to do the operation. The bolt of a I operation to pet kete korbu, or pet na kete pet futo kore korbu. And you also talk about the advantages of laparoscopy in the main, in, in, uh, if you can. Also, Alternatives. The HRR ki kora jay. Patient kintu jigesh korbe jay. Doctor, um, HR operation chhara ki arko no unno kono upay ase kina. Certainly, uh, you can do chemo radiotherapy, but tell the patient jay. HR of chemo radiotherapy dia shujog ase, but ita kore apna ke cancer shorano jabe na. Ek matro bachar upay hotsi ke cancer ta ke shoriye thi ke fill dite hobe. Cancer na clear korle ita action mai apnar Liver is up, your lung is up, your brain is up, and ultimately, your mind is up. So, this is the only way to take it. You also talk about that. What is the stage of the disease? That is clinically, what is the stage? Je, apna je shomushata huye chhe, ba apna je cancer ta achhe. Eta amra dekchi je ekono bish bhalo achhe. Eta kono jagay chhorai nai. Othoba eta you can also talk about that it has spread to the liver. So we must talk about the stage of the disease and what we are going to do. How can the, we can benefit the patient? Take a tip. Certainly we must talk about a stoma. If you think, even although you understand, you know that in right-sided colonic malignancy, we usually don't do stoma, but at times you may need it. So if you need it, patient, ke, you must say, you have your boys, you have diabetes, you have your diabetes, you have your cancer to advanced, you have your cancer to advanced, uh, stoma thakle bhalo hai stoma jinish ta ki eta peter moddhe amra ekta line kore dibo jekhane apnar mol joma hobe okhane ekta bag thakbe bag er moddhe mol joma hobe ebong eta kintu permanent noy eta sthayi noy eta hocche osthayi eta apnake amra der mash pore eta bondho kore dibo and most importantly you must talk about if it's an advanced disease you are going to give the patient chemo radiotherapy je uh, patient uh, apnake uh, amra operation er pore Chemotherapy, but radiotherapy, or dial up tepare. Sheta depend corre, Amadej Mangshu to Ketan Yarbo, but you met the Ketan Yarbo, she Mangshu Purika, reported Rupa Nirvor Kore, Abner Kiki Lagbe Shetamra, Korbo. So it's very important nowadays. Many of the examiners ask uh, about what you are going to do, what you are going to tell the patient, especially in rectal cancer and even any type of operations. You must be able to do the counseling. It's, you must have a very good counseling. It's very important in your student life and more important actually in afterwards when you'll be a real doctor and when you'll be talking to the patient remember this the patient is always judging you the patient is always judging you he's 
he or she is thinking whether I can, I can trust this person, whether I can trust my life with this doctor. And it is how you talk about it is very important. Uh, you should do, if you are not well in counseling, not doing good in counseling, patient will be a doctor to do operation. You must be very confident and you must be able to address all the questions of the patient, all the mm, fear of the patient. And only then the patient will accept you as a surgeon. So after that, Kiki Lakse, we need a bowel preparation. A very important is bowel preparation. Now, there are some controversies. Sometimes we do go for bowel preparation, sometimes we don't. In the Western countries, they are now avoiding bowel preparations because of bowel edema and other problems. They are talking about it. But we, you talk about bowel preparation. How we do the bowel preparation? Bowel preparation, usually two to, two to three days the recovery amra. Um, uh, let's say we advise the patient to take low residual diet. Low residual diet means fiberless diet. First day. Second day, take a liquid diet. And up to the evening before the surgery, patient take a liquid diet. The amra. Be previous evening, take a amra, patient take a uh, in pure aki, but nothing per oral, and we give an enema in the evening. Evening at enema di, rat, uh, usually the kajaja, rat dosta ragi, patient at pet clear huja, and give the patient a sedative to relax. Hmm. Then in the morning, you go for surgery. Awesome. It's also written in the Bailey and Levin, many other books. Check it how the bowel preparation and done. Very important and very simple thing to do. Thromboembolism profile access. Thromboembolism profile, like, as you know, usually the colonic uh, malignancy and colonic tumors, uh, the surgery takes about four, uh, three to four hours. So long term, the patient is uh, in a static position. So uh, there is always a chance of thromboembolism. So you give uh, start thromboembolism profile access that anti-thrombotic stockings, heparin, and manual compression boots, whatever you have. Sometimes nowadays we commonly use heparin if we have suspe suspicion that the patient may have a thromboembolic uh, episode, then heparin, but low molecular heparin is being used. IV prophylactic antibiotics, again, just when you in during induction of the patient, you give the IV antibiotics, uh, you can give ceftriaxone, uh, you can give cefuroxime, metronidazole, these are the antibiotics usually we give. Surgery is the gold standard. Remember, surgery is the gold standard for any surgery, any, any, any malignancy. It can be curative, it can be palliative, depends on the stage of the disease. Usually T1 and T2, definitely we can do a curative surgery. But if it becomes a T4, then very difficult to do any surgery or if it is a metastasis, then it's always a palliative surgery. Patients T3 and T4, usually we go for adjuvant, new adjuvant therapy. New adjuvant chemoradiotherapy to downstage the tumor. Although remember, um, colonic malignancies are not very responsive to new adjuvant chemoradiotherapy. So, uh, surgery is always the mainstay of treatment. Principle, okay, let me see. For example, let's say, if this is the colon, this is the ascending colon, right? So if there is a tumor over here, then what we have to, what, are the, what is the surgery? You must do an end block resection of the tumor with five centimeter proximal and five centimeter distal. Now five centimeter proximal means the small bowel could be removed. Usually we remove about 20 centimeter of the small bowel. Now, and we have to do a lymphovascular clearance, right? Lymphovascular clearance, what does it mean? Lymphovascular clearance means the lymphatic drainage of this patient, which follows the arteries. What your the arteries? 
the iliocolic artery the iliocolic artery the right colic artery and the middle colic artery remember the middle colic the right colic and the iliocolic these are actually branches of the superior mesenteric artery right superior mesenteric artery so we ligate them at their origins uh, if we are doing a carcinosicum then only the right branch of the middle colic artery should be ligated um, let me show you um, let me give you a bigger picture and let's see if i can make things a little easier for you okay if this is the colon and let's say this is the superior mesenteric artery this is the middle colic artery this is the left branch and this is the right branch this is the right colic artery and this is the iliocolic artery right and let's say this is the small intestine so if the tumor is in the cecum then we have to remove the tumor with the whole of the ascending colon up to one third of the proximal transverse colon and 20 centimeter of the terminal ileum. So this is the part that we have to remove. And with the lymphovascular clearance, how do we do that? We take the iliocolic artery, the right colic artery, and the right branch of the middle colic artery. These are the three arteries which we ligate at the origin, at their origin. And when we have done that, and after we have done that, we attach, bring the ileum to the colon. So this is an ileo transverse anastomosis. So what do we do? What are the things we are removing? We are removing the tumor in block. removal of the tumor then the whole right colon the cecum the terminal ileum and one third of the transverse colon together with the lymphovascular clearance that means ligation of the vessels that is iliocolic, the middle colic and the right colic artery at their origins and then iliotransverse anastomosis. And then iliotransverse anastomosis. So this is what we do. If you have any uh, problem in understanding, you can tell me, then I will uh, again try to make you understand these problems. So this is the right hemicolectomy. This is called the right hemicolectomy. Now, for example, if a tumor in, is in the, if the tumor is let's say again this is the colon if the tumor is in the hepatic flexure 
then we have to remove up to the right two-third of the transverse colon and we take the middle colic artery from the origin and then then we attach the ileum with the left two-third of the transverse colon. This is called extended, extended right hemicolectomy. There are many pictures of this in the Bailey and Love and other books. Have a look at this today and you'll have a greater understanding of this problem. But remember what are the things we remove? We remove the end block. That means together, removal of the tumor, the right colon, the cecum, then terminal ileum, right one third of the transverse colon with lymphovascular clearance, followed by ileo transverse anastomosis. And remember, lymphovascular clearance ideally should have at least 15 to 12, 12 to 15 lymph nodes. That should be removed. We may have to give chemo and radiotherapy. These are uh, not very effective in uh, right-sided malignancies. Radiotherapy may have to be given. Some of the indications which are not needed. There are many pictures like this. Have a look at this. Again, look at this. We have removed this part and then anastomosis is being done over here. There are many pictures of this in the uh, different uh, websites. Have a look at those. Follow-up. Follow-up is done up to five years. Follow-up is done for five years. First year, three monthly. Next two years, six monthly. And then yearly for five years. And after five years, the patient is free of the malignancy. Mostly we do a CEA level to assess it. If we find it rising, then we do a contrast and her CT scan. And colonoscopy is done every three to five years. Uh, this is a algorithm how to do this. Thank you for your time. Uh, if you guys have any questions regarding this, you can ask me and I'll be happy to answer. Today we are actually out of time. So next day, we will again discuss something about the colonic malignancies. You, if you have any further questions, you can ask me then. Thank you so much.